so that um, all of the other scholars and mentors who can't, who couldn't show up today, uh, can have still have participate. Access, participate <laughs> have access to the information. So as usual, uh, Dee Dee has made. Uh, did she hand out the little? I didn't. I'll hand it out right now. And so we will ask you. Um, I think it's pretty self-explanatory, but she can explain it here in a second. Today, today we have um, invited Dr. Greg Newman, and he's an assistant professor in the Ecosystem Science and Sustainability Department, um, and associated with the Natural Resource Ecology Lab. I'm going to write all of that. It's a lot of words. I'm going to write that here. But he's going to primarily um, his identity. I think primarily is uh, the person, the creator of a platform to support citizen science projects. So he's going to talk about sitsci.org, which is um, that platform. And so what I would like you to do today is to really brainstorm and think about how we can use citizen science to increase um, and address issues of diversity and inclusivity, right? Because that's what this, this um, series is really thinking about, place-based, education and thinking about social justice and who, how can we include more people. So we thought citizen science would be a way for us, you know, it's a tool that you can keep in your toolbox for thinking about this. Okay. And the grid that I handed out just kind of lets me, like I'll collect it after we're done, but it kind of lets me know what connections were you able to make um, with what Greg speaks about. Thanks, Dee, <laughs> and thanks, Mina. A um, couple of thoughts that just popped into my brain, too. This is really great to get this context and to meet you all. Um, I was saying there's coincidence that this title is Making Sense of Place, and I was actually just involved with, uh, gosh, 12 different colleagues working on a paper on place-based citizen science, actually. So really tying and coupling citizen science to place-based issues, local place-based things, and it made me think of my home state of Michigan, since we're cold and shivering here, um, to say, okay, so how many people have heard of Flint, Michigan, and what happened in Flint? So that's a good case of really grassroots, bottom-up, place-based citizen science that bucks the norm of what you traditionally read about in common citizen science practice, like the e-birds and the iNaturalists of the world, where the, and I mean this the most, well, I'll just say, there's a lot of privileged folks out there who have wonderful amounts of time to devote to great causes. And many of those are, are the traditional citizen science volunteers we know and love and have time to go tell us where birds fly and where um, plants and animals might reside. But the, 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 I'm also involved in the Citizen Science Association as a board member and as a founding board chair of the association. And I was asked to think about inclusivity and diversity and issues of this nature um, today and I can actually speak to great length a little bit about that in the sense that the association itself is really making that a huge priority moving forward as an association. It's like a two year old association, it's relatively new. They've had, well, maybe three or four years now, they've had two conferences um, of which about 600 practitioners in citizen science came to talk about issues in citizen science and at the forefront of those is almost always inclusivity. How do we get the populace involved in citizen science and not have a biased a group of people come who might not represent that diversity? So just good things to think about and um, I appreciate the topic because that's near and dear to the association's heart. Um, so let's see. Um, I'm just going to try to throw this into presentation mode here. The slides are not the most important thing for today, really. I just want to start talking about citizen science. What is citizen science? How it can be used as an engagement tool? That's definitely not working. There we go. Um, there we go. So, um, you know, what is citizen science, and what flavors of citizen science exist? How does it? How can it be unfolded in a community? Um, how you might use it in the classroom, right? And um, and then you know what we can do with it as a tool. So I'm gonna show some TV, and we're gonna sit back and use our brains to say what what phenomenon might we be witnessing? Is this voting behavior? I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> Bike thefts across the country. Let's hope not, right? So um, this is the year 2008, and we're in December. We're jumping over to January. And we're cruising through some phenomenon in, back in 2008. And so I just want to use a little time to brainstorm and throw out 
ideas as to what phenomenon we're witnessing. Any ideas? It seems like a migration of something. Okay, we're going to vote for migration yeah. of something. I can't pick up one. No. Other ideas? So... And what is the bottom? December, is so this is January through December. Oh, it's one year. It's one year. Wow. Throughout, oh, okay. throughout the duration of the What does season. the, um, and what do the colors represent? So, great question. One this is scale. a 0 to 0.12. What does that mean? It's low to high. Think of it as low to high of something. Low to high activity or presence or? Anything. Yeah. Any phenomenon. Yeah. So it's, geez, it was negative one Monday night. Could be low to high temperature. It could be. Kind of looks seasonal. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Any guesses? Does it have anything to do with Cornell University? <laughs> oh, which? <wait, wait. laughs> It might have some. <laughs> That's what I was thinking. I say, well, then I would guess mm -hmm. birds. <laughs> if it's more it's 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 definitely it's getting hotter. Getting yeah, so this is, in fact, the migration of a, of a species. It's the savanna sparrow, um, as evidenced by and actually modeled. So this, this isn't reality. This is a model, a prediction, an estimate of reality. Um, as evidenced by observations accumulated through eBird, which you'll hear about later tonight. Um, and have anybody know about eBird? Okay. So eBird is an app on the phone for the amateur birders of the world who have binoculars glued to their eyes 24-7. Um, <laughs> Nina's a passionate one in the back. And, uh, well, I'll bring the back. Yeah, yeah, so right. He's <laughs> coming in a little bit. So fortunately, the, the eBirders of the world take their smartphone app out and they report where they saw what bird went. And modelers at Cornell Lab of Ornithology took that data and made this spatial temporal model of prediction of where the savanna sparrow might be. So really it's like suitable habitat for the sparrow. It's not exactly right. We don't know exactly where which bird went where um, because they're not tagging these birds necessarily per se. But they are using the observations, the presence observations to predict where the species might migrate. So science, so we advance science, so this is all, this is citizen science. These, are, these volunteers are citizen scientists, they're out there doing wonderful things and scientists can use the data that they generate to um, to make those predictions. It's about really slow connection, it's so fast. Okay, let's try this again, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Just didn't want to stop that animation. This is when you try to go to the next There we go. <laughs> yeah, we're happy day. So we like to think of citizen science as participation by the general public in scientific research. It's that simple for us. Let's see if I can actually hit this little quick. Here we go. Other people like to see it as very much more narrow. So volunteers who collect and or process data as part of a scientific inquiry. So if a volunteer I use this example because it's a real example. So there's a volunteer in Wisconsin who was a seamstress. She was wheelchair bound and she couldn't get out there and make those observations of the savanna sparrow. In this case, they were looking at invasive plants. They were working on control of purple loosestrife in Wisconsin, which is a very noxious weed. So the seamstress sewed nets so that the other volunteers could then put the nets on top of the purple loosestrife and deploy this weevil which ate the invasive plant, which was a biocontrol. So they were working with the State Department of Natural Resources. It was a collaboration, thinking of stakeholders and diverse stakeholders. They got a bunch of people together to try to combat this invasive plant. My question to you then is, is and then a bunch of volunteers went out and monitored the, the purple loose strife and said, what percent cover, right? They measured percent cover, and they said, well, how much of the weed is there? And so the volunteers did a lot of things for that project. So my question then is, was the volunteer sewing the, the net, but not collecting data, a citizen scientist? And I see some nods, thoughts. 
it's an interesting question, right? So what, what do we mean by participating in science, right? And so this particular author says, no, no, no. Those people who are collecting and or processing data are the volunteers that are participating in citizen science. I personally would argue a little bit slightly different. I like to see a big tent person. I like to see people participating in science in ways that they can, right? From a diversity and inclusivity standpoint, that's actually quite interesting. Um, other flavors of citizen science, people talk about community-based monitoring, um, concerned citizens, government agencies, industry, academia, local institutions, NGOs, collaborating to monitor, track, and respond to issues of common concern, flood monitoring, the floods of the, the big times in flood. People might look at restoration success. They might monitor aspects of the environment of interest to them. I like to see that as citizen science as well. This is another popular one, crowdsourcing. Well, it can be seen as simply the process of outsourcing tasks to a large group of people. Um, in this case, scientific tasks. And so there was this great paper in 2015 that talked about, well, some of the ben benefits of citizen science, engaging people in decision making, promoting collaboration, bringing fresh perspectives. Again, a diversity and inclusivity standpoint. Um, from a local ecological knowledge perspective, bringing those who are often marginalized into the discussion might bring fresh perspectives, um, maybe even unique novel research ideas that need to be studied, things that are of interest that might not have been known. So for example, Flint, Michigan, it wasn't really known that that water was contaminated to the degree that it was and was causing health effects that it was. So the, 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 that whole idea of studying that would have been missed because researchers wouldn't have thought it was of, of interest, right, had they not brought that inclusive voice to the equation. So spreading knowledge, answering local community questions, incorporating local knowledge, building awareness, improving scientific literacy, which is definitely an outcome, um, building expertise and skills, lots of benefits. But it's not a fit for everything. So citizen science isn't the right thing for every situation. Um, the same authors talked about maybe volunteers collecting high quality data, if, you, if it's a good fit when volunteers can do that, when the research question can't be done in an affordable way in other ways. So one of the, the tenets of citizen science is you can get things done at a larger spatial and temporal scale that could not otherwise be done by hiring graduate students like our very own Danny in the back. She can only collect so much data as a single person at a single place in Colorado. So if she engages a crowd across 50 states, she can get a lot more information um, across a lot greater spatial scale. So um, public participation in science is your goal. I mean, if, you, if you're really looking at an outreach and engagement goal, it's a good fit. But just be aware that citizen science isn't the best way to do science in all cases. It's just a way in many cases that can work for certain outcomes. There's different types of citizen science. They can be, this is back in the day, um, where we will look at describing these programs as externally driven, professionally executed, externally driven with local data collectors, um, collaborating, collaborative monitoring with external data interpretation, autonomous local monitoring, so everything from an individual on a particular lake doing something in isolation by themselves to getting a lot of help from a lot of other people. More recently, those have been just talked about in the, in the language of the seas. So for some reason, they, I don't know if it was by design, but folks have started to call these different flavors of citizen science, they all happen to start with C's. So contractual, contributory, collaborative, and co-created, the three in black are the most common talked about. Um, and so what do those mean? So if we think about science, and we think about studying something, we think about defining a question. What, what is it we're trying to address? What, what question are we trying to answer? Gathering in some information, maybe gathering a team, looking for colleagues, looking for partners, collaborators, stakeholders, so gathering some information. Developing explanations or hypotheses about what, what might be happening with respect to the research question. Designing data collections, collect samples, you know this, it's the scientific method. Just reframed here in citizen science context. In a contributory citizen science project, the emphasis is engaging folks, members of the public, in collecting and analyzing data. I say analyzing because you know, the Zooniverse platform, which is a platform for like online, very image-based analysis type of image recognition stuff, started with the Project Galaxy Zoo. So Sloan Digital Sky Survey took a million images every second of the universe, and so they had too many to go through. So researchers were saying, dude, I can't classify all these galaxies through these images, there's too many of them. 
So they said, well, let's make it a bigger problem for the whole world to solve. So they created a game-like application called Galaxy Zoom, in which on your phone you can take these images and you can say, yep, that's a spherical galaxy, and nope, that's an elliptical galaxy, and blah, 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 and you click through them. There's a little tutorial. You walk through your tutorial and you classify galaxies in these images taken by the Sloan Digital Sky Survey. Um, so Galaxy Zoo was a raving success. What was taking graduate students months to do even 100 images, took us a week to do like a million images. Super <laughs> great success, it was unbelievable. So that has then proliferated through what's called the Zooniverse. If you Google it, you'll find a bunch of these. They might take old ship logs and try to have people transcribe the handwriting. And if 10 people say that that word was this word, then there's a weight of evidence. And they can say, yes, this is what that log said. And they can plow through a lot of ship logs because there's a lot of people doing transcription for image analysis. So in the contributory sense, folks are collecting data like eBird or they're analyzing data like Zooniverse. In a collaborative project, they're involved in a greater degree of this process. This is not in any way to show that this is a better or worse situation, but it's just a greater degree of engagement in the, in the greater degree of steps of the process. And then finally, in a co-created project, they're really you know, setting out to ask their own research questions. Like in Flint, Michigan, they, they came up with the question, what's wrong with our water? And they went about gathering evidence and getting stakeholders and partners involved to help them answer it. Um, so that would be more of a co-created scenario. So what we did, this is, so back in the day, I might back up for a second. Yeah, we looked at, this is back in 2007. We, our team at the Natural Resource Ecology Lab, looked at the eBirds of the world. There was about three. There was eBird for birds. There was Kokoraz for weather, which if, I don't know if everyone's heard of Kokoraz. I have a rain gauge in my backyard, so I'm a citizen scientist myself. I go out every morning and say how much rain or snow fell. It's the community collaborative rain, hail, and snow network. Say that ten times, you get an A. Coca Rocks. <laughs> but um, in any event, uh, so there was that platform, there was eBird, and there was a, a phenology, right? So the timing of events. In this case, it was plant phenology. People would go out, look at that lilac bush, and say, when did it bloom? So there was about three things you could study in 2007, unfortunately, and we felt that was not so great. So we went out and said, well, why just birds? You know, why, why not do something different and set up a platform where you can study something of relevance to you? So our team at the Natural Resources Ecology Lab set out on this mission to provide a comprehensive support platform for citizen science globally so to really get these initiatives happening all over the place um, and happening with a variety of topics of relevance to local places and communities with the goals of supporting the full spectrum of citizen science. So, People think, and I'll talk about this in a little bit, in fact, I might even draw on the board. It's like, well, if I were to ask you how to do citizen science, you might say, sure, you know, you, you want your, your research question, um, and then set up some methods, maybe, and then you collect data, you know, and then you analyze it, and then you're done. Yay, success, simple. Um, seems pretty straightforward to me, um, but in reality, we wanted to support the full spectrum of citizen science because in reality, in a citizen science context, defining this research question and this simple process really involves recruiting volunteers. Um, so recruitment, this, this whole process might be retention, um, how do you keep your volunteers year to year participating, um, I, then I joke, but buying burritos. You gotta, you gotta buy burritos for your volunteers because um, you gotta train them and they gotta eat, right? We needed food. Um, so there's training here. Uh, speaking of go get food. Speaking of, yeah. eat while I talk. Yep, yeah. you come out of that, don't be shy. Because um, it's Maslow's hierarchy of needs, right? Yeah. <laughs> you gotta get that right. So anyway, then you gotta figure out, okay, what kind of protocol are you gonna use? And what kind of experimental design? Are you gonna do random sampling? Are you gonna have your volunteers just look anywhere for the Savannah Sparrow? What are you gonna do? Um, and then what kind of statistics are needed? Is, do you need some sort of power analysis? Um, you know, that kind of questions. Who are you gonna partner with? Um, are there scientists that are experts in the field that you might already know a lot more about this topic than you do? So gathering a team, setting this up, I mean, the collecting data, do you need to buy equipment? Do you need a pH meter to go out and look at the pH of the water? 
So what looked like a simple process now ballooned into this nightmare <laughs> of actually doing a really effective citizen science project. So we wanted to build a platform that at least facilitated a variety of set facets of the volunteer <laughs> management process as well as the scientific process. We also wanted to be mindful of making sure our data are rigorous and scientifically valid and then improving standardization sharing and interoperability and integration of this data so that the data can get to the stakeholders and decision makers they need to, the data to go to. So it was a lofty goal back in 07 to set up this platform where anyone anywhere can create and enact projects themselves and have confidence that they're hopefully going to be somewhat successful. Um, so we started with about 37 invasive plant projects. I'm a plant ecologist. I study invasive plants, and so that's what we needed help getting volunteer information on, and we had like 37 projects, and we said, yes, we're successful to the National Science Foundation. We have these 37 projects engaging ranchers, telling us where noxious weeds are, and we can do the e-bird thing for more than just birds. And then serendipity struck. But the next thing you know, I get emails from Boy Scout troops looking at maple syrup productivity in trees. I get emails from projects looking at hip dysplasia in dogs across large breed dog owners. I get projects wanting to study salamanders. I get projects wanting to study bats. I get projects. Next thing you know, one thing led to the next, and we're, this was like a couple, I don't know, even six months ago, 385 projects. We're at 525. 528 projects now globally and we're curating close to a million scientific measurements of volunteer data. What this pales in comparison to eBird, however, there's that much interest in the birding community that there's tens of thousands of millions of bird observations submitted to that platform alone. But we're growing and we're supporting more and more people, doing more and more science on more and more topics and that's exciting to us. So, Trout Unlimited is monitoring creek data. That ma master naturalist groups are looking at salamanders in Virginia. Master gardeners are looking at fruit varieties of like you know organic farms um, and productivity of those different varieties under different climatic regimes and glowing conditions. The Denver Zoo is looking at the American pika and looking at population declines here in the Rocky Mountains, given concerns of local extirpation in Nevada. Um, because they've lost the American pika in certain ranges in Nevada, and they're concerned about that happening here. Um, the Rocky Mountain Bird Observatory has a bald eagle watch. We have our NASA scientists looking at intermittent streams and the flow, the degree to which intermittent streams are flowing, and is that changing and affecting wildlife habitat? The list goes on. There's stuff in Costa Rica, Africa. So we're busy, uh, but that's a good thing. Um, because they, they were inspired by the great work of these people. So what we do is we create a space for them to kind of uh, scaffold their work. It's like a Facebook page for your Facebook profile, except it's a little citizen science project page. It's customizable, so you can turn on and off any of these tabs. You can make the, the submit data tab the first and be the first thing volunteers see because you want them to submit information. Um, you can customize it to a certain degree, to the degree you want. You can add photos and show photos of your groups and there's a forum where you can post forums and I'll kind of walk you through this. Um, you can manage members, so governance. One of the things we realized really quick is project governance. So there are some projects that are like eBird and they're like everybody should participate. We want everyone to participate. So please sign up and tell us where the Savannah Sparrow is today. Other projects are like, oh heck no, I do not want you to know where my ginseng is in Appalachia in the Great Smoky Mountains National Park because there's a black market around ginseng harvesting, believe it or not. And so heaven forbid that threatened and endangered species is known to the world where it, where it, it is growing. And that will just attract these poachers to go poach the ginseng and sell it. So they wanted to lock it down. We, we kind of put a padlock on some of these projects because they're private projects. So they can work in isolation from the world as an autonomous group of members who are studying something of relevance to them but they don't want the world to know about it. Alternatively, the e-birders of the world are like, heck yeah, we'd love to have everybody tell us where these pharaohs are, so we'll make it an open project. So we have different modes of, of managing this. We call member-based and open instead of really closed, because we don't like the term closed, but it's really member-based, okay? So you can basically approve people who apply to your project and you can edit their roles on your project 
So you have like the manager, and you have the expert, you have a contributor, and you can edit these roles and remove them and add them. And you'll get a, a pending request if a volunteer requested to join a member-based project. Hopefully, in the case of this, usually the way it unfolds is they have a training, and they don't want just anyone who hasn't been trained to submit data to their project. So they have a training at like the Denver Zoo, for example. People come, get trained on the protocol. They have a list of who got trained. They see the pending request, and they say approve because they know who you are, and therefore you're a member of the project. Alternatively, the open projects, it's just a simple click of a button. Say, I want to join this project and participate. The manager gets an email saying, yes, um, Mina wanted to join, and so thank you very much, she's in, but there's no approval. So there's different governance structures for different reasons. The Flint folks might not want everybody to know who they are, so they might do a private project, for example. Um, so once you have projects, and you got to kind of tell the volunteers what you want to measure. This is that whole method section. This is setting up a protocol. We used to call it kind of what's being measured. It's, it's kind of a growing, evolving list of things that are of interest to groups on sit side that they want measured. Um, so I joke about it, but you could have the number of water bottles. This, for some reason, I always say this, it's the weirdest example, but bear with me. So you could study the number of water bottles in federal offices, so like, you know, Park Service employees, Forest Service employees, and then you could have academics, and you could say which group has significantly greater numbers, so which one drinks the most water, right? Just because, why not? You know, which ones are the healthiest? You could study that. So if you did that, you would say, add measurement, and you would say number of water bottles, and you would tell it that it's an integer, right? Instead of a decimal, you know, it's not like 5.5 for pH. It's like one, two, three, it's whole numbers of water bottles. So you would specify that it's an integer, and, um, and then you would add it, and then people could, not only you could use that as having your volunteers self, self submit that data to you, but other projects could use it because it's in the system. So one of the things that we kind of serendipity discovered is, is people kind of replicate each other's work. So like the Front Range Piper project had a bunch of measurements of like the depth of the talus. Okay, they wanted the, the volunteers to measure with a meter stick how deep the talus is, because that gives refugia for the pica under a warming climate. So then they set up this whole protocol for the volunteers to measure certain things, presence, absence of pica, evidence of scat, for example. Then the uh, Oregon Zoo took notice and said, that's a great idea to study the, the, the health and viability of pica populations. We happen to have lower elevation pica populations in the Columbia River Basin, so we're going to replicate the measurements that the, the Front Range Pica Project is asking their volunteers to measure. We'll create an identical protocol for the Cascades Pica Watch Project. So next thing you know, we have eight now pro Piper projects across the Yellow Mountain West. Um, they're like growing like rabbits, but they're not rabbits. <laughs> um, so in any event, uh, that's a great success story because we're, we're kind of meeting one of our goals, which is standardizing monitoring when it's relevant to standardize. So all the Piper groups should standardize across a protocol. And that's serendipitously happening, which is really great. Um, so that's kind of how you do it. You specify what you want. You can measure categorical data, you can measure text data. For the discourse analysis people in the room, like me who likes to study prose and discussion, um, you can have textual data be submitted and that could be coded and analyzed as well. You can have folk, folks submit photos as evidence, of course. We're starting to add videos so people could take videos and then upload videos, which is also quite useful. Um, so, then, of course, we, we look at popularity, too. It's social media, right? we got to look at popularity. So the popular things to measure are height or percent cover, or diameter at breast height, a lot of forestry stuff going on. I don't know why. But um, presence, of course, is the women. People want to measure the presence of something. Um, so that's obviously a winner. So they do this using our tool called the Datasheet Creator. You basically add stuff to your datasheet. I like to call it Legos. You say, this is the thing I want people to measure. These are the units I want it measured in. So it can be any unit you'd like. And we just kind of build it up. And you set up a protocol. We have some complicated scientific stuff. If you're interested, most people, we like to consider an observation a point. So a point, like a dot on the map, at this location, I measured this thing. And it was me, and it was on this date. Um, and so that's kind of the who, what, when, where we want to know.
But in some cases, we can set up elaborate transects. So for the biologists of, of you in the crowd, you can have these transects that have certain areas that you can measure things in very rigorous ways, in which case you'd work with our team, we'd set up this little observation type, and you would pick like a Dobbin mile transect for the biologists or the plant ecologists like myself in the room. But regardless, most people just use points. What uh, then you get is like a stream monitoring field data sheet your volunteers can use. There's a, a map that automatically lets you search for an address and it pre-populates your location. Alternatively, if you're using a mobile app, it will know where you are, so it will automatically populate your latitude longitude. In some cases, um, projects know they don't really care that the volunteers specify the latitude longitude. Instead, they say just go to these locations, like the corner of this street and that street. In which case, they, they predefine a location, and the volunteer selects from a drop down, I went to plot 5 or whatever, wherever that is. Um, this is typical for water quality with this, the gauging stations, the USGS gauging stations. For some reason, they like to go to those gauging stations and measure the water quality at those places. Um, so, this is the not the predefined, this is where you search for a location, say where you are, it fills in the latitude and longitude. This is also on your smartphone as well. So then you go through and then you say, yep, this is the stuff I added. So below this, which is not shown, is all the stuff that you measure, like the pH, water temperature, whatever. If, for example, a project had been measuring, it had a citizen science project, and we'd been doing this for five years, and they said, geez, I wish I knew about sitside.org five years ago. No worry, you can upload your file as an Excel spreadsheet and bring it in in bulk and now you have 5,000 observations all of a sudden from the get-go because you've been doing this for five years. Um, so when an observation is made, a volunteer in West Virginia measured a creek, Tom Epling here, back in 2015. He gets a confirmation page. It says, yep, this is where you were, this is who you are, this is what you measured, this is the project it's in, the stream flow was low, I don't know, the pH was 5.5, and here's the photo you took of the creek, and so this is what they get when they submit their observation. Um, what this amounts to is monitoring since 2014. Now, all the way going on, this has obviously changed, but um, now up through 2018, of real-time dynamic data monitoring. So the Trout Unlimited volunteers can look at any number of variables across time at the same time, and they can look at trends in this case, in water temperature and air temperature, um, but you can look at pH and whatnot. This we program the system to do some general descriptive st st statistics. Can't say that. Um, mean, min, max, standard deviation, etc. Um, so you can kind of get an idea and start using this as a great learning opportunity. If you're in the classroom, you have your students do this. Um, maybe they've been doing this each year, cohorts of students every class, and maybe they've generated this large amount of data. Now you can start exploring the data with your class, and you can start asking scientific questions, teaching math, statistics, etc. I'm so gonna, I'm going to jump in here and say, for those of you who are teachers um, at any level, right? This is this is addressing um, all of those quantitative literacy standards um, that are part of both the Common Core state standards, visualization of data. Um, we think of Common Core. We some states, um, you know, still use that as a framework, but also thinking about our both the state academic standards and then next generation um, science standards, which are really talking, infused in both our state and our national science standards are, um, you know, nature of science, which is how are we asking authentic questions and actually how are we collecting and analyzing authentic data to try to help. So this is a tool where, you know, teachers, maybe your students are not actually, they're not collecting the data for, I mean, it would be great if they were and uploading it, but you have access to some of these other data that other projects are already uploading and it's an opportunity to actually go and ask students to make sense and meaning of the data that's already there. Absolutely. And so a lot of teachers ask for authentic data, right? Because they'll say, well, I don't know, I don't have the numbers to have students practice graphing, for example, or interpreting graphs. But this is just a, you know, this is this repository of all kinds of information. And it's all science content. Yeah, this, this is an open project, so you can just dive in and log in and see it today. And it would have changed because they've been continuing to do so on the monitoring. So this is, in fact, open, this particular project. And you can just dive in and dig in, for sure. Um, that's a great, I keep thinking, I forget that 
other people could use other people's data, right? That's, right. that's the whole point of an open platform. So. And that's what teachers actually are very hungry for. I mean, I'll look to Mike. I mean, sometimes it's hard to find um, to find authentic data, data sets, mm -hmm. and so here it's right here. <laughs> I mean, it's all and all different types of projects. And it's somewhat place based local. and local, right? From a yeah. Pika perspective, the Front Range Pika project is here in the Front Range, right? So there's a very local something issue that you can tie to students and teachers, yeah. you know. Those might be familiar with the, the mountains and hiking. They might say this is kind of exciting, right? To play with this data set. So yeah, this is kind of how it works. Um, back in the day, when I took this screenshot a long time ago, these were the projects across the globe that we were supporting. They've kind of been all over the place, um, and they're growing. Um, this is the Front Range Piker Project data in a sea of other data. So yellow dots are just sits our data for any topic. But I've selected the Front Range Piker Project kind of in a GIS sense. Headquarters is in Denver, but here's all the Front Range Piker Project observations. So you can explore it you know, with charts, you can explore it with tables, you can explore it with maps. These are all opportunity, learning opportunities, really, for students. Um, and then, well, you know, what are, these, they, what are these things, right? What do they mean? <laughs> you know what I mean? Um, you know, what do, do your students want to know what these whiskers are? I mean, is it just, you know? draw them on a face and make it look pretty, or the error bars, what are standard errors? So, and is this different, is this not different, what does this mean? Making sense out of data, there's a lot of opportunities. So SITSI will let you compare any number of locations to any number of locations with any number of measurements. I think we're looking at two measurements, four locations, and you can kind of see what's going on, are there differences, if so, why? You can look at relationships. Right, so this is a dynamic relation, a scatter plot. Right, uh, is there a relationship? Is there not? What does that mean? Lots of exploration and opportunity from a STEM perspective. I'm going to jump in again and tell you that a former doctoral student studied in our local school district uh, was studying uh, the scientific literacy, the science literacy of science teachers, compared to the types of assessments, how they were assessing their own student science literacy. And what she found, and I'm saying this because our um, uh, the, our mentor and teacher here is a middle school teacher, uh, she found that middle school teachers did a, an excellent job. Their science literacy was quite high and matched the level of their assessments. So they were asking a lot of questions about graph reading and graph creation. The high school teachers in town, is there are no high school teachers <laughs> in the room, even though there's a former high school teacher. Um, is that uh, their science literacy was quite high, but their assessments did not, it, they actually fell short in assessing their students' graph reading and graph um, creation. Mm -hmm. And so, for those of you who want to be high school teachers, remember, we, high, middle school teachers do a great job of saying, here's a bar graph, here's a scatter plot, here are these, here's a frequency histogram. And then, for some reason, you know, the high school teachers don't follow up with that because. Um, I don't know why, why, but um, so here again, I'm just going to reinforce the fact that this is a tool where you can go and, and find these data. That's really interesting. So all of this can be done too on your mobile phone. So we do have smartphone apps. They're not perfect. So apps are hard to make perfect. I'll tell you that right now. <laughs> but uh, they do work. Yes. So I was wondering, um, is the data backed up? Um, somehow, and then for a website like this that starts to become really massive, how do you, you pay for the website itself? Yeah, so that's a constant. I, I thought I was a scientist here at CSU, and I thought I was a plant ecologist, but now I'm like a sustainable business model development guy. Um, we're really working on that issue hard. Um, so, yes, the data are backed up for first question on a very, very regular basis. Um, we have off-site backups as well as on-site backups, and it's all in the cloud. So right now, these data reside on a CSU cloud server, cloud-based server, so it's a virtual server, which is kind of nice. And the reason that's nice is you can replicate these servers in a virtual environment. They call them VMs, and you can have another one, and you can have what they call a load balancer. So for the technical people of the world, this is how Google works. And Google's huge, and they're getting requests every second, right? And so they shunt 50 requests to this virtual machine, and then they sent, shunt another 50 to this virtual machine, and you can scale. So you're basically making replicas of sitside.org and letting them go to the different one that can be responsive. So there is a centralized database behind this thing that is backed up on a regular basis. 
Um, it's actually backed up on three virtuals and then off-site. And we're replicating this in actually, it's a competitor to Amazon, the Amazon Cloud, but it's called DigitalOcean. And it's cheaper than, and a little bit more scalable than the university's cloud. So we're actually in the process of moving it to DigitalOcean, which is basically like Amazon Web Services. So we're, we're scaling. We're trying to address that from a business model standpoint. I'd love your ideas and feedback on this because this is not how a science. I got like, like you sound like a business model. Yeah, this, <laughs> this, is, this, is, this is definitely not my business strategy. But we're learning from NSF actually. We just went through the i -Corps program, which is Innovation Core for Innovators or something like that, which tries to teach us scientists how to think like a business, like a commercial entity. So we are trying to keep, eBird does this because they're an NGO, the Cornell Lab of Ornithology, people can buy eBird hats, so there's a revenue stream that supports eBird, which is great, we need that, so we need hats, but we also need <laughs> subscriptions, so I don't know if you're familiar with like MailChimp, or Evite, or uh, Netflix, or I'm trying to think of eBay maybe, but MailChimp's the best. So e-newsletters, do you ever get these e-newsletters from companies? They say mm -hmm. the latest updates. Um, so what that is, is like a MailChimp might get, so it's called a freemium model. So for the business savvy of the world, now that I'm learning, I just new stuff I get to learn. Um, freemium model. So what this is, is there's a free plan, there's a basic, and then there's like an enterprise. And so what that means is if you have like 20 volunteers, you get sit side for free. But if you hit 100 volunteers, you gotta have subscribe for 19.95 a month or something. So although the university is not in the business of making money, we are in the business of supporting this in a long-term way. And so we are curating and hosting data for people currently for free. And NSF isn't gonna pay me to do that forever. So um, I've gotten three NSF grants, and they, but there's probably gonna not continue to give credit more money. So we're trying to. Uh, well, they're like, you got it figured out. You've done a great job. Yeah, maybe. But otherwise, I'll just keep doing that. So instead, we're trying to find these sustainable business models. So, like, Trout Unlimited is an organization who likely can and probably will pay for, in the near future, SITSI.org and underwrite the little groups that for free. So, your Boy Scout troop might be still free, which is great. So, good question. So, what the, anyway, I would love. Maybe we need have to challenge. Yeah, it's a big challenge. But it's also great because we do get grants that, like NASA funded the Stream Tracker project for intermittent streams, and it's it helps support SITSI because, but it's also research money. So the purpose is to study the degree to which NASA satellite data can be used to detect intermittent stream flow. It's like a correlation between whether there's like green up and, and stream flow and whatnot. So NASA is quite interested in that research result. But meanwhile, the funds are you, can you be used to, in part, support and underwrite SITSI in general, which is helpful. But that's the bane of my existence, is trying to fund this thing. But we've been up and running since 2007, and it's going good, it's looking good, and we're trying to grow. Well, and you've got something now that looks valuable. People and see a lot of value. That's yeah. good. There's traction. Believe it or not, we've, we've talked to folks who are interested in advertising because there's a lot of faces going to SITSI on a daily basis to submit these data. And people want those hits. They want those, people might like, you know, binocular companies might want to park an ad on SITSI.org. So we're working with the university business office and all this stuff to say, okay, is this legit and how do we do it? And it is, as long as you do it right. <laughs> um, so there's a lot of things we can do where we can maybe put a nice non, uh, not obnoxious ad there, but yet all of our volunteers who might be interested in binoculars can see that ad. So it's a captive audience, frankly, for folks. So great question. I wish I had, really, I really would do wish I had <laughs> good answers because I'm trying to figure that out. Um, and you know, it's funny, we started this as a research endeavor, like, can it be done? So we were asking the question, can we have a platform that's topic agnostic, that lets you study anything of interest to you, and I think we've proven that that can be done. But now we're, <laughs> we find ourselves in a very different situation, which is a scalability, support, platform, operations kind of scenario, which is actually a really fun place to be, actually, but different. 
So back to the science side of things. What can citizen science projects do for the world? And so we like to categorize this. This is by no means comprehensive, but it's a little hard to read. Sorry about that. But those scientific impacts, those participant impacts, those conservation impacts, those decision policy impacts, those literacy, right? I guess that'd be education. Do I, I don't even have education. Of course I should. There's a fifth one here. Nina can talk a lot more than I can about it. But there's literacy impacts, right? There's educational impacts. Um, that, that's obviously related to participant impacts. So increased knowledge, there you go. Um, alter behaviors, increased social capital, improved self-efficacy. Um, so that's like a in inclusivity, diversity kind of thing. People feel empowered, like they actually have a voice. They feel like they're, they're not marginalized. That can be very powerful and transformative to certain cultures and segments. Um, so scientific impacts, you know, there's peer-reviewed journal articles, like we, you know, I think we're going to hear about one later today, with that the oh. bird disease that yeah. was studied from eBird data. Yeah, the cinch in the microphone. So you get peer-reviewed publications out of citizen science. You advance science, right? You, and you have increased data sets, um, maybe maps, um, improved knowledge, um, support review hypotheses, generate new theories, um, participant impacts, increase knowledge, develop skills, change attitudes, potentially alter behaviors, increase social capital, improve self-efficacy. Self Conservation, you could actually have data do things. I mean, the citizen science projects physically do things. You could restore wetlands, build trails, remove invasive species. So not only study the removal, but do, actually do the removal, right? So now you're actually a steward of the land while studying something, improve habitat, mitigate wildfire risk, restore streams. These are just examples. Um, you can inform policy, policies, determine species status from like a global rank perspective of endangerment. Um, inform lawsuits, guide land management, so like um, land management um, documents can be guided. Um, inform local and national policies. So there's a lot of impacts of citizen science that are potentially possible. And that support the highest level of science literacy. So the highest level of science literacy, the multidimensional level, is being able to make decisions based on evidence, right? So based on scientific evidence. Not knowing, it's not knowing content or answering questions, solving problems which you do in labs. No, it's about that next level. <laughs> it's getting to that next level, which is actually making decisions about your personal behavior that are informed by scientific content. And so Maybe your students aren't actually building a trail, but or removing invasive species, but they can describe the intention, or they can um, come up with, you know, what would be a plan of action. Um, maybe it's at a theoretical level in their in your classroom, but it's still at the level that's that's reaching that highest level of science literacy. And so again, a citizen science project is something is one way that maybe they can enact change in their school ground. Maybe it's not, you know, at this national level, but it's actually demonstrating that highest level of science literacy. In the Flint, Michigan case, there were people, behaviors were changed, decisions were made, policies were changed at that highest level because of the evidence, right? And so there was interpretation of the evidence accumulated that said the water treatment facility needed to change. While that was happening, people were just choosing, deciding, based on that evidence, not to drink the water from the tap, right? So those, those are high level cognitive um, impacts that that citizen science project had. I'm gonna mention this, I was debating, I asked Laura if I should, but I'm gonna mention it anyway, we have, we have um, some young people in the news who are currently trying to enact change because of, uh, not of a citizen science project, but, but something that was very tragic but this is a case, this is something actually what our schools, our, our standards actually celebrate, right? Because now we're actually having students who are able to use evidence, use information, formulate an argument, using logic, using reasoning, and actually building cases, whether you agree with what the argument is or not. The fact is that they're articulating an evidence-based claim and making a decision. And in this particular case, they're, what's amazing is that on their own, they've organized themselves and have gone to the capital to try to enact change about school safety. And so it may be the content might be something that's controversial, but I think um, really I think it behooves us as educators or future educators to think about what can we do to empower our students, right? If we're thinking about inclusivity and about social justice, 
what is it that we can do to enable our students to have those data, yeah. right? Because adults only listen to to data, <laughs> data driven decisions. They're like, give us the facts, give us the give us the information. And so when you think about as a teacher, how can you prepare your students to actually generate these data, interpret these data, and then use them to inform something, either a decision or making an art, developing an argument, or and and so so what Dr. Newman here is showing us is is here's a tool as a teacher that you can, that you can use. A great example of that, I'm really glad you <coughs> brought that up, Nina, is, is there was a lane you know, in Wisconsin, had a pontoon boat, lived on a lake, and was a co-created project, really more collegial actually, it was a, an N of one. He did, and he said, I'm concerned about the algal blooms in my lake, because he likes to look at his crystal clear blue lake, right? So he started studying it as a scientist, right? And he said, well, I'm going to take my pontoon boat out, I'm going to drive the same strips, and I'm going to do secchi depth monitors, right? This secchi disc thing that he could buy, and look at how far he could see down, how clear the water was. So bless his heart. And then he started getting <laughs> data that he found from other sources about like non-point off points of support pollution sources mm -hmm. for like agricultural runoff and whatnot. Went to the Capitol building and presented his case and tried to change the non-point source of pollution laws in Wisconsin to try to prevent agricultural runoff and eutrophication of lakes. That's, that's like the holy grail of literacy, right? <laughs> I mean, that's what you'd like to see happen. So, and that actually, this is a guy who started on Sitsai and he just studied this lake. It's called Berry Lake, so you can see. Anyway, it's just really interesting. Um, and so that's kind of like a celebrate success kind of moment. So. So, although we like to say that, speaking of that literacy, and we like to say, oh, that, you know, as a scientist, I make all these claims that citizen science is the most amazing thing. Why the heck do you believe me? Like, who am I, right? <laughs> so how, how about evaluating these claims scientifically, right? Where's the evidence? If we're going to talk about evidence, where's the evidence that we're changing, you know, people's attitudes or behaviors or, or informing policies? And so I actually did some work related to this and was finding not so much. <laughs> the literature was saying citizen science is having these wonderful things and I was showing not so much evidence for that, especially when it comes to decision making. So although the guy in Barry Lake is a great guy, <laughs> and he, we, he and I had a lot of conversations about how to architect his, he reached out to us and so we, had, we walked him through it, but um, there's actually not a great number of percentage of projects on sitside.org that are having that degree of impact. It's the minority, not the majority. So we, we, we wanted to self-evaluate ourselves, and then we wanted to ask the questions, well, how can we improve these metrics to actually get the, the impacts to come to fruition? So that's where we're at in our thinking, is, is actually how can we do a better job, frankly, of in, integrating, and Amina and I actually, this, the whole onboarding project, which didn't get funded, unfortunately, so NSF doesn't like Greg all the time, but um, <laughs> that's okay. Uh, but the thing is, is that we were actually trying to figure out how we can bring in professional development about some of these aspects into the platform to improve the game of these citizen science projects. We still want to do that. We want to do more with sitside.org to help them do better work um, with our mantra of helping you do great science. Um, so that's really sitside.org in a nutshell with an introduction, hopefully, to what citizen science is. You know, I don't want to just sit here and talk about a platform. It, it's, it's got its limitations, it's got its assets, as does any platform, from the Zooniverse to eBird to Project Budburst, if you're studying plant phenology. So, we, and Kokoros, you know, I, I certainly advocate finding platforms that work for you in your classroom and or your local community citizen science endeavor, and figuring out what tools are out there, what works for you, and then going forward and, and conquering, you know. But, um, we really are starting to try to study the phenomenon of citizen science from a social perspective, a social science perspective. We want to learn about participant motivations. We want to learn about barriers. Why aren't, do, why don't we see a lot of Hispanic projects on this platform? Is that what, why, from an inclusivity perspective, from a diversity standpoint, is, the, is there some things we can do to like decrease barriers to entry to citizen science for a particular culture? So there's just a lot of rich areas to study in the field of citizen science, to study the phenomenon of citizen science, but also support groups doing this great work. So, 
certainly take questions. Yeah, so I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to ask a question. So first, um, I'm going to, uh, because I invited um, another uh, an example of a citizen scientist,